or like I travel to Hyrule or something through yeah. music. I sure. travel to the Mushroom Kingdom. So there are other um, ways to get to the Mushroom Kingdom. <laughs> yeah, there are. <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, our resident musician Nick Kruger joins us for a discussion about the history and implementation of video game music. Plus, we debut a new segment called Reckless Speculation. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 34 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined by Jim. I'm here. And I'm joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we have a special guest today. It's actually my little brother, Nick. What's up? Um, He is the one who does all the music for us um, pretty much for free, which is pretty awesome. So Mm -hmm. um, I think the one time I ever paid you for the music, so to speak, was I bought you that um, 8-bit plugin. Yeah, no, you you paid for an emulator. I got to do the the soundtrack for, or the original uh, theme song, actually. Mm -hmm. You paid for the, uh, it's a software called Chip Sounds, and it has a bunch of different uh, 8-bit sort of sounds on it that I used to produce the theme song so yep well you know blood is thicker than software so <laughs> generally yes um especially because software is kind of more of a uh, electrical thing if anything if it has a physical form it's electrical so yeah true <laughs> that's okay i'm an only child so i really don't know <laughs> okay yeah i know i know we've been wanting to get nick on as well because um not just for doing the music uh, for the podcast you know, thank him for that but also because he knows a lot about music so mm. music is a big part of video games and i've always yeah. said that you know, it's something that really can make or break a game for me. And I think it's, it's usually overlooked. A lot of people don't really think about the music or the sound mm-hmm. because um, it's, you know, like in a movie, it's that it's the sort of thing where you don't really notice it unless mm-hmm. it's gone or it's done yeah. badly. If they're doing totally their job so. right, you're not going to notice it most of the But it, it affects everything. It affects yeah. your mood mm-hmm. in a game just as it does in a movie. Exactly. So. Or the absence of it. Yes. Can affect your mood. So, yeah. So, um, you know, on that note, our uh, main topic of discussion for today is going to have to do with video game music. Um, we're going to be talking about, sort of in general, how music is used in video games mm-hmm. and how it has kind of come from the beginning up until now, that sort of thing. But uh, first, I think we're going to get it started with some button mosh. Woo! Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. All right, so let's let's start moshing here. Uh, Chris, what have you been playing lately? Or actually, you know what? Let's start with Nick. Nick, what have you been playing lately? Uh, I've been playing a lot of Grand Theft Auto V. Oh, great game. Finally great got game. around to getting it on the uh, good old PS4. Hmm. Very fun, very uh, time-consuming. <laughs> Other than working, it's pretty much all I've been doing this summer. Because um, you're on your, like, you're through your second playthrough now, right? Yeah, no. I got through my second playthrough because I wanted to... Uh, there's there's a set of missions. I'm not going to spoil too much, but there's a set of missions where you can actually affect the stock market and invest the winnings mm-hmm. from your big score at the end of the game. Um, so you can invest. I started with like 40 million, and I got something like I think you can get up to 2.1 billion dollars. I got yeah. around 750 million, which was more than enough for the game. So so let me ask you this. Um, two questions. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, we're all about spoilers here, especially for a game that, that is this old. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so first question, who is your favorite of the three main characters? Uh, probably Trevor. Trevor? <laughs> that was mine too. So let me ask you, why? Is it because you just you feel like he's a kindred spirit and you're just like him? <laughs> well, I'm kidding. <laughs> totally. You're not. not You're not a psychopath. No, seriously. <laughs> not, not yet. Um, no, I think, I think it's most fitting uh, for Trevor to be the one doing like the the standard GTA mayhem sort of mm-hmm. thing because it's always weird when you're playing as Franklin and you just go around like shooting up you know the area around the hospital where you spawned it's like it's it's almost kind of uh, something that Trevor would do to just start shooting people randomly and then yeah, from the cops and getting in these big chases. Yeah, because in the story, Franklin's always criticizing his friend Lamar for being kind of like the typical gangbanger. Yeah, and, right. And so he's like, I'm above that, I'm a professional, but then when the player takes over, you're yeah. just like running over people on the sidewalk willy-nilly. Yeah. And Lamar. kind of n- luna narrative dissonance there. Yeah, well, Lamar's like, what, like a quarter Apache? So that's why he's so heated. Yeah. Isn't that what... Yeah. He's like a quarter Apache or yeah, something. Yeah, that's, that's what, I, what I he know. says anyway, so... Um, and, and my, I was... 
desperately trying to avoid a racist comment. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, he he says that all the time. Like he's just it's, it's, it's I, the it, Apache maybe, blood. Yeah, maybe less than a quarter or something. Yeah, but yeah, he's like yeah. always talks about his Apache blood, and yeah. that's why he's so <laughs> heated all the time. It's, yeah. it's hilarious. It, the way he sells it is really great. The thing is that from for the most part in the game, though, um, really I can think of like I'm trying to think of. There is a time when you have to assassinate someone and you don't necessarily know what he... You don't know for a fact what he did. But most of the time when you're killing people, it's like, you know, other people that are either trying to kill you or they're hardcore gangsters. And so it's like... It's not like... The game doesn't encourage you to go around and kill random helpless yeah. citizens. It really doesn't. No. And that's something that sometimes it gets... It gets a lot of, like... Um, flack for that. Mm -hmm. You know, people saying, oh yeah, uh, it's all about running around killing people randomly, mm -hmm. which is not really true. It just gives you the option to do that. And yeah. like you said, with Trevor, um, this is one of the things I like about the game. With Trevor, it feels like if you're role-playing as Trevor, he might do that. Mm -hmm. Like, he has those little missions where you just run into people and they say something to him that he doesn't like, <laughs> and he just starts going on a rampage, yeah. because that's what he would do. He's crazy. Yeah. But with, like, um, with Michael, he's more of, like, the typical subdued He's still a psycho. He's a, he is a, he's a sociopath. <laughs> yeah. But he's the subdued, not like the excitable, like mm -hmm. Trevor. He's subdued. He'll he'll he completely is willing to kill to get what he wants, but he doesn't kill for no good reason. Yeah. And then you've got Franklin, who seems like he has a moral code to him, but he still wants money. He still he's certainly not a good person. None of them are good people. No, mm -hmm. absolutely not. They're all still bank robbers. Right. <laughs> going and killing cops just yeah. so they can get to the score. And, I, yeah. and we're all mature enough to realize that. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's an adult game. It's yeah. for people that are mature enough to realize. It says M on the box, yeah. parents. Thank you. <laughs> right. I mean, it's telling, it's telling one of these stories that you see in a movie like, say, um, Scarface or uh, Godfather, Goodfellas, where you've got these guys that are very hardened criminals, not very nice people, but their stories are interesting, and it allows you to sort of see a bit of that world. In this case, you're experiencing it a bit more um, viscerally and in person, in a way, but still, it's it's still fantasy. Yeah. This is getting me excited about the good and the bad and the ugly yeah. topic that we're going to do soon. Mm -hmm. We haven't really decided <laughs> I'm excited yet. about it, too, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I know you've got some different, different views on it, and you've talked about not well, wanting to... You know, I I, get think, in that world. I, I don't. I don't think that video games make people violent, and I'm willing to punch anybody in the face who says differently. <laughs> there's, there's actually been. I mean, there's been some studies too that say that you know it, it can have the reverse effect in terms of yeah. it being therapeutic. It gives you social empathy, sort of, to see the violence and mm -hmm. you realize how bad it actually is. Well, mm -hmm. art in general is meant to have a give you an emotional reaction right. and change mm -hmm. your behavior. So, yeah. But we'll stick a pin in it. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I used to be a big fan of GTA. Mm -hmm. I really did. And, and Vice City is the last one I really played and really loved. Mm -hmm. It's not the one that I really played a lot. Uh, that was probably three or... No, San Andreas. It was San Andreas. Mm -hmm. But I just... I don't know. I just I lost the love for it. The I couldn't get into four. I couldn't get into five. I tried. I just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and for some reason, ever since, you know, Tommy Versetti, I just haven't had a, a main character I could identify with. Yeah, I liked I liked Tommy, but um, not to get too off topic. But well, we definitely have to put a pen in this. But I like Tommy, but I will say that going back and and um, playing Vice City again and San Andreas too, but especially Vice City, the mechanics are so rough. Compared yeah, to yeah, five. Yeah. Five is like unbelievably polished for an mm -hmm. open world game. I it just, is incredible in terms of the, what what Rockstar has been able to do with that genre and improve it so much. You mean what Rockstar has been able to do with that budget? Well, <laughs> not true too. lots of games have big budgets, yeah, and yeah. plenty of them suck. No, no, so, I, I, so. Will, I will say that Rockstar does a great job with their development. So, yeah. calling you out, Rockstar, who is avid listeners of the backward dash compatible of dot com mm. podcast, just like all the developers we mentioned last week. Yeah, like Blizzard and all the others. Yeah, yeah. Um, calling you out. It is time for a Vice City remake. Grand Theft Auto 6 VI I, V I C E. I, I I'm strongly against remakes as, as I've said before, but I would let. But we can stick. Well, Vice City was a remake. No, no it, it absolutely wasn't. was. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Mm -mm. In what way? Well, it, there there was an original. Um, like whenever what was it was GTA One and GTA Two, right? One of them was set in at least partly Vice City. Well, there are also several set in Liberty City. Yeah, there's yeah. several, but that's. Those weren't remakes; they're just using the same location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
And plus, this they've got this was, weird thing. With and I, was it a reimagining? Or a, no, or no, a, it was. Yeah. A, it was a new game. It was just in the same setting. Well, yeah, it has the, the same, same setting. City. And I agree. I, I, I would love to see one in Vice City again. I'd love oh, well, to see that's one what I meant. 80s themed, but that's not a remake. Well, no, no. Uh, although they did do a digital uh, reskin of it. Yeah, that's which, true. You know, I actually did a download of yeah. it and played about five minutes of it. But yeah, um, <laughs> on the phone and, and the tablet and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got it for PS3. Yeah. Oh, well, PS3. I was yeah. going to say it's also on the phone. It is. That's tablet. very true. Uh, very, so it's Bioshock. Very so everything's on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> Which doesn't, with, doesn't count as a button mosh game because yeah. it doesn't have buttons. With exactly. significantly worse controls. So what I've been playing um, mm. recently, um, I have I tend to play a lot of uh, you know older games on emulator just because um, I don't want to spend the inflated prices. I guess it's sort of a topic, inflated prices of uh, retro games. But, um, so you steal old ones? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, <laughs> I, I actually owned many of these. Plus, I, if I if I could give money to the developers in a way that was like fair, I would. And I do buy a lot of games from like Virtual Console and stuff like that. But way too many to like try out games and stuff like that is just too much. Mm-hmm. Especially experiencing games that I haven't played before. Um, I played Zelda on my Wii. Yeah, I I, I own multiple copies in different mm-hmm. ways of playing Zelda. But to be perfectly honest, I kind of prefer playing it on my uh, laptop. Through an emulator because That's I can cool. control how you hook a controller up. Yeah, I've got a controller and it's um, actually a. Um, I actually imported it from Japan and it is this like Famicom remake controller. It's really? like a really good reproduction. Is set. it rectangular? Yeah, it's exactly the right. <laughs> That's it, cool. has, it has turbo buttons. It's got um, the original like red and gold sort of color scheme for the Japanese. Yeah, sure. Version. Yeah, yeah, it's really great. It even has hidden shoulder buttons, but you can't really you always see. It actually is an eight button controller. Just it's got. The buttons laid out the same way. It's got rubber start and select buttons. Nice. Good D-pad, good buttons. The, bu- the buttons are actually um, the concave ones, slightly concave, mm-hmm. like the original controllers. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's oh, yeah. really good. But anyway, so I've been playing a couple games there um, recently. I played through. I got up really, really early, maybe like three in the morning or something. Sometimes I can't sleep, so I thought I'd uh, play through Life Force, which is one of my go-to games when I was growing up. And um, it is a space shooter, kind of like Radius, only it has both a Horizontal and vertical orientation. I remember Life Force? Yeah, yeah it's, it was called Salamander in Japan. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's actually a really awesome game. And I used to be able to go all the way through it with just you know a few lives lost, and I had to use the Contra code to get through it. And <laughs> I also couldn't even get through it with thirty lives, so yeah, I was oh. kind of disappointed in myself. But um, used to be much better at, at those games, I guess. Um, I also decided to play through Zelda somewhat recently, um, or play through some of it. Uh, Legend of Zelda: The Original on the NES. I did the same thing actually for Zelda 2, but that was a little bit farther back. Um, but I thought, yeah, I'll just start with the second quest huh. because I I, huh. I figure I played through the first quest on Zelda 1 so many times that I know where everything is like instantly. So <laughs> I've only played through the second quest about like four or five times versus like 30 or something for the first quest. So I started up the second quest and I was just blown away by how much I got my ass kicked. So much harder. It is so much harder. It is more than twice as hard. The enemies are much tougher. You know, they sometimes they do different things, like the the, um, the Stalfos will shoot their swords at you, things like that. Um, the first dungeon, I couldn't even get. I couldn't even get to the boss because I didn't know where the where the final key was. In the last room, you have to kill Wall Masters. Spoilers. Um, in order to get the key to drop, and it's like something you never saw. That I. So it's really, spoilers for a thirty year old. Yeah, for like a thirty year old game. Yeah, um, it is. Very, very hard. And, like, one of the things that they recommended that people would recommend when I look online was to basically grind rupees so that you could go and get the the blue ring right away. Oh, so that nice. you would basically take half damage, which is kind of almost cheating because you're basically... One of the things that makes Second Quest so much harder is that you take more damage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're just instantly getting a ring to take less damage, which you can technically do before you even go to the first dungeon. Just what everyone recommends. Yeah. Huh. Plus, it kind of takes away the sort of, like, adventurous feel to it. Like, yay, I've finally gone through enough of the dungeons to get to the rupees that I can get this blue ring with. You right. know? Yeah, exactly. But you know, in 1980... What would that have been? Seven, Seven I think. I, I totally would have done it if I'd known. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. True. If I'd known where the ring was, and I... I mean, come on. <laughs> so That's true. And no, you I, didn't have the internet to tell you back then. That's yeah. right. But you could right. buy you could buy the special guide, or you could call the Nintendo Hotline. Yeah, well, you know, I had I had Nintendo Power. I was the only friend amongst my friends who did. I, I thought went you to, were really popular. Well, and, I, and I was over. Well, I was overseas. Well, see, and so it was this crazy kind of thing where you know there was like twelve people in my class. I was the guy with the Nintendo, and I was the guy with Nintendo Power. You know, mm-hmm. I was 
I was the, you know, the guy. They didn't too. call me doctor. <laughs> See, I, um, no, I had, no, the girls didn't, actually. They, uh, they thought we were big nerds, but... <laughs> I had it too, Nintendo Power, and I was going to say the very first issue, if you remember, with the one with the cover of Mario 2. Yeah. It actually had a whole story about Zelda's second quest, specifically. It did. And the reason was that, of course, it, it, was, it came out, I think, about a year, af- year or two after Zelda. Um, had already released, mm-hmm. but they were trying to build up some hype for Adventure of Link Zelda Two, which That's was right. not. Gonna, it was supposed to come out like almost with that issue, like very soon, but it ended up being like delayed. But anyway, they decided to cover Zelda the Second Quest because it was something that some people hadn't discovered yet. It mm-hmm. was like you just found a whole new game. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I had a kind of negative experience with with the two, but. Uh... That's Zelda okay. Two. Yeah. Well, my aunt one was, of my favorite games was coming time. to visit, and she was supposed to bring me Zelda because I had rented it and I liked it, and she brought me Zelda too. It was so completely different that I was frustrated. I hope you've gone back and, and given another chance. This is an excellent game. Very different, but it is an excellent game. Yeah. It, you know that time came. It's still not my favorite as far as Zeldas go, but um, I can see why you'd be disappointed because it is. Keep in mind, I was twelve. Yeah. Well, plus you're, you're <laughs> you wanted ex- another Zelda. There is yeah. a lot. You're <laughs> you're expecting a certain sort of game, and so I understand. Especially, I understand that. I understand yeah. when you when you want a certain game, it, even if it's good. I mean, I had an experience where I wanted um, a Mario game, and I my grandmother got me Mario Was Missing, which for the NES, which anyone has played it, it is essentially an educational game mm. where you play as Luigi. See, I also was a huge Luigi fan. We've talked about that yeah, before yeah. on the podcast, and. Um, I thought this is great. It'd be like a Mario game, but you get to play as Luigi, rescue Mario. Um, yes, Mario is the damsel in distress in this game, <laughs> not Princess Peach. So progressive, very progressive for like 1990, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was so bad because you actually don't kill anything. I guess it's, I guess it's progressive. You don't kill anything yeah. either. You can't die, and it's education. And you don't kill anything. <laughs> so you just run around and you talk to people in town and you get little tips and then you solve like you know educational history lessons or something. I guess if you're not expecting a Mario game, actually, that could actually be kind of cool. It, no, it was bad. It was okay. You <laughs> finally get to Bowser, like, because you do eventually, you get to, like, you have to beat Bowser multiple times mm-hmm. and rescue Mario. It's like, oh, Mario's in the other castle, something like that. I can't remember. <laughs> but um, yeah. Bowser just runs around and he acts like if, you know, he just runs towards you and you think, oh, I just have to jump around and jump on his head. Um... Because you do have to jump on his head, actually, to, stop, to beat him. Oh, but, so there is violence. No, well, sort of. It's like, but you, you hurt him. He's like, okay. Oh. <laughs> but also, like, he can't hurt you. He runs through you. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's so... it. <laughs> I really wanted to destroy. That's very out of the box. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So now, it was it was ahead of its time. It's 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 pretty much nonviolent for the most part. And you're 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 rescuing a guy. I mean, this. Come on. How'd you feel about Luigi's Mansion? It's a great game. Remember that one? Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. Awesome game. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. I did have a game that I wanted to talk about, but uh, I think I've talked enough for a little while. I'm going <laughs> to pass this over to, to Chris. Chris, what have you been doing? Uh, well, I remember... Tabletop gaming-wise. I remember uh, a little while ago, I haven't had a chance to do too much tabletop gaming recently, but um, we met up with some old friends at uh, Madness, um, and we ended up playing a little game of um, uh, Red Dragon Inn, mm. uh, which is actually pretty cool. It's basically a... Um, it's a drinking game within a board game. Um, and actually, if you wanted to, you could probably house rule it so it actually does become a drinking game, like for real. Um, but the Pretty idea, easily. Yeah, <laughs> very easily, in fact. Um, but it, basically, the way it works is that you um, each take a character. And uh, it seems like that's actually a fairly long series of kind of standalone expansions where each box comes with, I think it's four characters, and then you get like a deck full of drinks. Um, and each character has their own deck with special abilities, and you can kind of figure out that um, you know this character, the style of play is to you know take this strategy versus this character has a different strategy. And um, basically, what you're trying to do is um, be the last one standing because if your uh, drunkenness level um, exceeds your vitality level, um, which can also be dropped while your um, alcohol level is going up, um, then you lose. Um, so you're trying to uh, basically get everyone else at the table drunk enough that they get knocked out and you're still alive. But what intrigued me about it is, um, one, I, I liked the art style. Um, it kind of has a almost a um, visual novel style presentation where you see a background um, that pretty much stays the same for all the characters uh, in that set. But then the character themselves, it's kind of like this front-facing uh, image of them, and each card that they have has kind of like this sort of 
um, nice flavor to the title. It's usually like a line of dialogue that they might say in that situation. And they've got a different expression or a different pose. And so you can actually go through and get a pretty good sense of this character's personality just from the cards, which is kind of neat. Um, and I also like the idea that each pack seemed to have its own sort of um, aesthetic to it, a different theme. So it, it's generally like it's meant to be a game about the fantasy RPG party at the tavern between quests. Um, the one that we played in particular was actually a pirate expansion, so you could either be um, uh, playing you know, in a tavern with a bunch of other people, you can actually combine the sets as I said, or um, in this particular case you're actually um, doing this in the captain's quarters on a ship. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a little rule modification you can add as well that makes it so that the, uh, the conditions of the sea can affect the gameplay, which we ignored because we wanted to keep it quick and simple in this case. A lot of us hadn't played yet. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a cool little game. Uh, it seems like it's got some nice strategy, and once everyone knows what they're doing, it moves pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a game that... Uh, I think they actually said in the rules, like if you're playing with 13 or more people or something like that, <laughs> they yeah. do this, and so you can definitely have a room packed with people while That's playing terrifying. this game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was pretty fun. I enjoyed it. I can see it being a lot of fun with 13 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, for me, recently, I've been playing uh, a game called Jen, the Warring States. Um, so it is a... Um, Role playing game, mm. completely, you know, tabletop role playing game. And spell that for the audience. Uh, Q I N. Q I N. Yeah. That's Jin. So it uses, I think it's like the Chinese, I want to say like Pinyin or something. Mm. I forget mm. the different terms for like the type of like Romanized version of their alphabet. Right. Just making up words now? No, it's, I, I, <laughs> that, I might be using the wrong one. Mm. Um, and the, the, also the weird thing is that it's also a, um, a French game. It was developed by a French developer, which... Oh, that explains Let it. me see. I, I, I looked up the name to see if I could pronounce it. Um, and I will butcher it. Uh, Le Septime Cercle. Let me, let me take a look at that. Good luck. <laughs> uh, Cubicle 7 uh, brought it to um, English-speaking countries and translated it, but... Le Septime Cercle. There we exactly. go. Thank Something you. Like um, <laughs> Chris, so, with yeah. its two years of high school <laughs> yeah. Spanish. Yeah. 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 French. France. This is France. Well, see, there you go. We, we, we love you, French friends. We really, we really do. All five of you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it, it is actually um, a very interesting game. It takes place in uh, the Warren States period, mm -hmm. um, like the name suggests, which is about this huge period from like, you know, 220, uh, or sorry, like 450 BC to like 220 BC. Um, but yeah, this game is based a lot on uh, it's a martial arts based, but specifically Wuxia, which mm. is a it's originally was like Chinese um, stage plays, like kind of um, opera esque. For people that like a lot of kung fu movies, like me, you'd recognize Wuxia as movies where there's a lot of wire work, mm -hmm. a lot of like flying or magic mm -hmm. related uh, related with the kung fu. They're not just fighting; they have it's like, the more sort of fantastic elements. Yeah, yeah, like they can they can make their body like iron, or mm -hmm. they can like jump 50 feet in the air they can run like on the side of walls yeah and do things. really cool yeah and they can do of course and of course they have weapons but their weapons they're sort of like flash around much yeah. quicker than they might really be able to and mm -hmm. maybe they even have um magic and mm -hmm. so that's that's part of the game too you've got magic and you have tau abilities and tau are sort of like the special using your chi to do a whole bunch of really neat stuff mm -hmm. um no hadoukens but you can do a bunch of cool stuff. House that, rules. That, that's House more Japanese. <laughs> so. Right, there you go. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's very interesting. What it uses is the system where um, you have, you just use 2d10, and then that's sort of like your modifier for whatever stat that you have, like your stat and your skill, you add them up for whatever you're trying to do. Um, and then you just roll the uh, the, the yin-yang die, which is basically a white and a black uh, 2d10. Mm. And the idea is that you're trying to get, um, the difference between them is added as a modifier. So you're trying to basically get them to be separated as far as you can. Um, if you ever get them on the same number, it's a um, you're, you're considered to be in perfect balance, and so you get a critical essentially. Oh, cool, cool. So there's a there's a lot of criticals because mm -hmm. you have a much higher increased chance, except for double zero, which is a critical failure. I see. Um, but it is very it encourages narrative play. It encourages to roll, to not roll if you don't need to roll. It's mm -hmm. very much focused on trying to get the flavor in the setting. Yes. So I play this with some friends who um, mm -hmm. I do play some tabletop uh, role-playing games with, but we tend to do a lot of, you know, loosey-goosey kind of rules and sure, yeah. um, sort of do our own sort of system and not really sort of minimize, minimize rolling. I think part of the issue was they didn't really want to bother to get into the theme and the different... Mm -hmm. I mean, character building took a little longer than maybe they would have liked. Uh -huh. Probably should have come with pre-made characters. That might have helped you. Um, but yeah, they... 
um, weren't quite getting into the story. So I had maybe not the best experience running the game. To be fair, it's my first time running it. Too. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah sometimes a, uh, a role-playing game can be made or broken by the type of group you're playing with the yeah, GM. Totally. A, lot, a lot of different factors. Well, so. they, they love, they're the kind that loves to just wreck shit and be reckless yeah. and <laughs> terrible people. Yeah. So that was not the, the story I was trying to run and because mm. of that, I think, I mean, it's like, hey, let's let's help this, like, you know, mm. nobleman who's been robbed. No, let's just rob him ourselves. <laughs> uh, guys? He's, he's still clothed. We could rob him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this government official, like, said something to me that I don't like. Let's kill him. Uh, Wait, no, you can't. You're going to be arrested, and, like, the army's going to go after you. <laughs> so, it's it's a whole thing. But um, it's, it's, it's a game I'd like to return to at some point. Cool. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Gaming Meta. Well, there is a piece of gaming news that is a little bit little big. Um, I know there are a lot of Shenmue fans out there, mm-hmm. and uh, one of the big things that came out of E3 was the announcement that Shenmue 3 um, was starting the Kickstarter. Yep. Um, I am a Shenmue fan. I was excited to hear about the game. Um, of course, it got funded. I knew it was going to very quickly. Um, quickly broke all the records for you know most funded game. But um, there is a little bit of controversy there because Sony, um, first of all, they announced it on their own you know press conference at E3. So already there was a connection there. Um, and then, of course, we later find out afterward that Sony is help uh, essentially Sony is publishing the game. They're also putting up a sum of money to help produce the game. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of like co-producer, co-publisher, or co-producer and publisher. Um, of course, the game is still owned by WiseNet, which is the company that uh, Yu Suzuki, I believe his name is, mm-hmm. the Shinmu creator. That's his company, his private company. Um, and of course, Shinmu is a very expensive game, but I, it did sort of re-raise the issue that I've noticed um, on Kickstarter for a while, which is more and more large corporations are starting to, large game companies, I should specify, are starting to use Kickstarter as a way to fund projects. Yeah, yeah. And they'll sort of They'll try to. A lot of them will try to sort of hide it. Like they'll splinter out into certain people that are on their team and kind of. But it's it's that's what they're doing. There, it's to me, it comes across as kind of dishonest. I mean, even when they're honest about it, I guess when they're upfront about it, I guess it's not technically dishonest, but it feels like they're misusing something that is really more for really small projects and indie projects, mainly because when a game like, for example, Shenmue Three comes out on Kickstarter. It's going to instantly get millions and millions and millions of dollars. Whereas, you know, indie projects go on there; they're looking for like, you know, ten thousand or mm-hmm. like fifty thousand or something that's a lot more respectable, and they can't even get it because people are so excited about something like Shenmue Three. Yeah, yeah. What, yeah, are, you, what you, are you guys' thoughts on this? Well, uh, we we experience firsthand what happens to an extent when uh, your project gets eclipsed by a bunch of big ones that that's come out. That's true. Yeah. And to be fair, a lot of these projects that came out around the same time that we launched Genre, they were indies. The thing was, though, that they were indies that had big, successful Kickstarters before, right. and now they're kickstarting their sequels. Celebrity yeah. indies. Um, yeah. Which, and, like, you know, nothing against those guys. They're great guys. They're awesome games. You guys um, backed I, I, them I, Yeah, I backed several yeah. myself. We yeah. did. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, like, I was super excited to see those, but it's like, could you guys have not done it when we were doing our thing? Because, like, you know, when you're an unknown, Kickstarter is one of the best ways to sort of get seen because it's a platform that a lot of people use. Yeah, that's right. And um, possibly was now. Yeah. I mean, we might but, start having to put was in there. Not yet, yeah. but we're getting there. <laughs> um, but when it's when it's up happening is like some of the best visibility you can get is when, um, you know, you are trending highly or mm-hmm. when you get a, a Kickstarter staff pick. Mm-hmm. The problem is that the staff pick is going to go more to the people who have big polished things that have been there before, especially mm-hmm. over, you know, the unknown developer that might just have an interesting idea um and so like you know i'm not by any means blaming or not getting funded on that there are sure um, plenty of factors and like most kickstarters don't get funded so statistically you know we were the norm um but yeah it, it is kind of an interesting phenomenon to see kind of you know th- there's no rule that says you can only use it to sort of get off the ground once but it, it does kind of and hurt people who are just trying to do that one point i would make i do want to make a distinction when I talk about this, that I'm really talking about these large companies that have so many ways of making money. Yeah, like Sony. not, not, yeah, not, not indies. Because mm-hmm. I, because I do think that you know it might seem like oh this indie company made it because they made all this money and now they're sort of known, mm-hmm. but that's not necessarily true. I mean, I know for example, I have a couple of friends that have their own you know comp- indie company, very small. It's just it's just you know the two, the three of them, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
they they had a successful Kickstarter, but they they are trying to do another game. They did successfully take it through Kickstarter as well, but. Um, when they were started to run that Kickstarter, people would send them emails, and there would be talk from from others like, "Hey, why are you guys putting this through Kickstarter? Didn't you have didn't you make enough money from the other and all this kind?" Of, it's, it's like, "No, we didn't. They did <laughs> not even close. Yeah. They they made enough to get by, and mm-hmm. the reason why they went through this Kickstarter is they, they is they wanted enough money so they could support themselves mm-hmm. while they made another game. Yeah, and so that's what I think is the reason why I'm so worried about all these large companies going mm-hmm. on there is that there are people that. This is kind of how they make their living. Mm-hmm. They use Kickstarter as a means of supporting themselves while they make a game. And then when the game comes out, sure, they might make some profit, but it's not going to be enough to keep supporting themselves while they make a new game. Yeah, it's not. It's just they're not going to have enough saved up unless it becomes an obscene success, which is extremely, yeah. extremely rare. Very rare. Yeah, it is. So it's a little. It's and even that has its own problems. Mm-hmm. Right. Like uh, Exploding Kittens has a distribution problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they got uh, over pledged. Yeah, they did. <laughs> um, now, actually, uh, on the other hand, though, I will say, like you know, with Shinmu and maybe some other projects that have been backed on Kickstarter, it might be the sort of thing where a, pu- a big publisher, even though it is a big title by a big publisher like Sony, um, it's still probably seen as a risk because people don't know. It's like, well, it's been so many years since the last one came yeah. out, and it might have been more of a see, cult hit. So it's see, like it's, that's it's a risky. Yeah, that's position. the argument where I've and, heard and, that before. Yeah. And I, I think it's bullshit. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of business, and I also think that. That's one of the bigger excuses that you see from these companies for always releasing garbage. Is like, oh, we don't want to risk spending our own money. Yeah. Well, so now that they've well, got Kickstarter, they it's can also cover their own ass. right, which is bullshit. <laughs> it's also I think though, that's bullshit. You're making people spend money for your product when mm. you should be making it yourself. Uh, that that I see the point there, but it also tells you very clearly that we have a lot of people who are willing to buy this. Right. Whereas you might but just they're also taking research, their money. They're not just leader. willing to buy it. They oh, already yeah. did. True. Yeah. That's the difference, True. though. And if it, it doesn't get funded, that's another issue. Too. I think it comes <laughs> it's very secure business. <laughs> it comes so. down to risk transference for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, an example that has like nothing to do with games. You know, the the, the talking duck, uh, Aflac, right? You know, mm-hmm. the, the Gilbert Godfrey duck guy. Um, that company is is gap insurance, right? They make their entire everything they do off of this idea of gap insurance. Well, within the t- context of the uh, the gaming world, what you're basically doing whenever you take it to a producer is you're saying, produce my game and take the risk for me. Mm-hmm. And the producer says, yeah, absolutely. We're going to take 80% of the profit, too. Right. So if you compare, um, let's just take an, a, a hypothetical indie game. Oh, maybe we could call it genre. And, um, you know, a, a company was going to put it out there and have it kickstarted and basically do it at cost. Uh, so that that game could be a title that was you know out in front of the company, that's a completely different model than if you take it to the producer. And if the producer sells millions and millions of copies, you might actually make more money off of even one or two percent than you would off of the Kickstarter. Right. But you've not retained control of your brand. You've not retained control of your um, product. And so that's what it really comes down to: is the traditional models versus these new models. So where I call foul on, well, even guys like um, Telltale, Mm -hmm. right, is whenever they use this model to get a whole bunch of money because, oh my gosh, you know, Tim Tim Schafer spit on a wall. I'm going to, I'm going to buy that. Um, And then the the product isn't, isn't up to snuff because they just kind of crank something out because of reputation. How long is that going to last? And I think, I think you're on to something, whatever you say. Not long. Um, I, I think there's always going to be the yes, I'll, I'll kick in the money mm-hmm. because it's a big name thing. Um, but I think it's either going to bring down the entire system, or there's going to come up a contrivance by which people recognize that and then stop um, stop funding those types of games somehow. Maybe I, I mean, well, we talked about this in episode 33. But gamers are suckers, and uh, <laughs> they, they they are. And so I'm not so sure that that, that that necessarily will happen unless we get to the point where it's so egregious that um, you know there's another gaming crash. And to be perfectly honest, and I've, I'm sure I've said it before on this podcast, I think we're due. You're not going to swear like you did last time, are you? No, okay. uh, I think we're due, and I think we need to. I think we need another crash. I think it's time to, you know, wipe the slate clean, uh, nuke it all, 
go straight. This is a metaphoric nuke, by the way. For oh, listening. okay. Um, like, have you been playing yeah. GTA Five? Are, are you? Are there's you, no nukes. There's no nukes. <laughs> so you play Fallout and you nuke things. That's true. I think, I think I'm only you for have a giant crash. Gun that nukes. I'm yeah. only for a gaming crash if it increases my odds of getting a job in the industry. Well, <laughs> I think it would actually. Probably <laughs> would. A yes. crash doesn't mean that that yeah. it's all going to go away. No, what happens no. is it's going to get rebooted and, and remade by someone with creative ideas, which is what happens to happen the last time with Nintendo. Yeah, but you know who's going to survive the crash? EA. Blizzard. No, that's the point of the crash. People would have said the same thing about Atari back then. Yeah, they didn't. Well, they were, you know, that's the perfect example of a company that that you would think they would, and okay. then they got crushed. I'll give you that one. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of. <laughs> this week in gaming history. No. <laughs> Actually, I and Activision a- found a way to. But see, the difference was that back then, Activision, who had split off from Atari, they were a creative force. Yeah. So that was now they're not, but they were. Um, I do think that this. This early, um, sort of like early game discussion it is kind of leading us into our uh, main Run topic. Us. Yeah, it does but I will I will say that we do have a uh, little bit of reckless speculation before we move into our main meaty topic. All right, which was what we were doing with the gaming crash talk. We were already kind of talking about reckless. Right? <laughs> thank you, thank yeah. you. Grab your salt shakers because it's time for some reckless speculation. Arcs used to engage with rumors, hearsay, and all sorts of crazy theories. So, uh, reckless speculation, because I know I've been hearing a little bit about um, the Nintendo NX, which yep. is like sort of the code name for Nintendo's new console, mm-hmm. and some people are freaking out, because they're like, oh no, they're moving already from over from the Wii, what's going on, are they abandoning their customers? Well, I'm sorry, but the Wii U kind of is a failure in terms of financially, they need, you know, it sort of is. It's only made about, it's only moved about $10 million, mm-hmm. I want to say, like, money-wise. It has been doing better. I think there was a story that came out not too long ago that was saying that they basically broken even or something like that, or cool. they started turning a profit. Profit-wise, and that's something that people love to try to, every every generation, it's like Nintendo's going to go out of business. I think, I mean, it's, it's no, obviously they're nonsense. No, they're, they're going fine. <laughs> yeah. They made so much money with the Wii, they could have still they could still be unprofitable with the Wii U for, mm. like, the next five years and still be cool. Right. Plus, they're still making money with the 3DS. So mm-hmm. it's not about money. It's about yeah. also... They need to still establish themselves as being relevant to the console yeah, market, yeah. and uh, that's why there's talk of the Wii U. And Miyamoto has come out and he's made a few statements about how he recognizes that the um, Wii U was a failure in some ways. I know Nick, you've heard some about this. Yeah, no, he. I, I read an article somewhere saying that he uh, basically said that he recognizes that the Wii U is a big failure, and he thinks that a big part of it was that uh, they were developing it around the time that. Uh, tablets were just first entering the scene, mm-hmm. entering the market, and they kind of accelerated at a, at a rate that was too fast for them to keep up with in their development. So, like, they they released the Wii U that was kind of a lackluster tablet by the time that you know iPads and everything had gotten really big, and that's that's what he says. I still think it's just bad marketing, to be honest. I think it's a combination. I mean, I think that explanation I can totally buy for they had this plan because they because all these companies they plan in advance, and the tablets got. I mean, I still remember when they were first announced, and I didn't really think they were going to become as big as they were. Um, so it's definitely one of those things where it really quickly the tablets tablets became huge and everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Everyone had to have one, yeah. and so I could buy that as 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 part of the argument. Of course, the other part is I think that they after the phenomenal, ridiculous success of the Wii, which you really can't downplay how much profit they made off of that. It was mm-hmm. hugely, hugely successful. Yeah, but I think they kind of. Um, not, and this is not really me, but he's not part of the marketing team. Yeah. But their marketing team kind of got, I think, cocky, and they thought, "Hey, we've got this great, you know, console. We're just going to call this like Wii U because it's like <laughs> basically the same thing, and people will just buy it because it's got the Wii name on it. Yeah. And we're already out there, and we're already known. And they just thought all we got to do is release something that's going to print money. I think is, I heard something too about how a lot of people just thought the Wii U was simply the tablet, and, and that was the bad marketing to the Wii, and yeah. that was the bad marketing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because um, they didn't think they needed to market it. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I really enjoy my Wii U, and I think that it's definitely on the up and up. I think it's definitely gotten a lot better. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of huge games that have come out in the past couple of years. Smash Bros., Mario Kart. And Splatoon, there's some that are I mean, planning yeah, to come out, too. Stuff, there's, yeah. there's, there's announced games. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know, um, uh, it's called Xenoblade. Xenoblade um, X. Mixed with the other one. X. Chronicles yeah. X. Chronicles yeah. X. I played, I played the other one on, on uh, the Wii, which I really enjoyed, actually. So mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to it. It's a good, it seems like yeah. a good RPG. Plus Bayonetta um, 2, that's already out, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's been out for a while. Yeah, it's yeah. been out for a while. But yeah. that's a big title. So. Oh, yeah. No, they, they have And they that was actually Wii U exclusive, too. Yeah, yeah they have some really? big titles. Yeah. Oh, wow. They, they really published it for pl- um, Platinum Games. Which, by the way, that was a very content... Like, they... People oh, were very... Yes, I think you're right. Platinum. 
but they were very pissed off about a lot of, a lot of people, gamers, whatever, the suckers. Uh, sorry, I'm calling you all suckers now. It's all right, I'm a sucker too. Um, Don't antagonize your audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, we can I'm, all be suckers I say this. I say this out of love, actually. I, I, I love being a gamer, but also I recognize that gamers also can be really big suckers and get drawn into this fanboy warfare and all this nonsense mm-hmm. and let the companies play you against one another to make more money. Mm-hmm. So it happens, unfortunately, uh, and um, this is one thing that always kind of annoys me about um, gaming and gamers. But um, it's something that I kind of fall into occasionally as well. But yeah, like they they got really uh, pissed off because they wanted the game on you know PlayStation and Xbox and all that, and they were mad that it was only on Wii U, and they didn't quite get that they only got the game because they were paid for it. Like the company was out of business, and they basically helped, basically gave them money to make the game. And of course, they're not going to give them money to make the game and then say, oh yeah, put it on our competitor systems too. (laughs) <laughs> that makes perfect they're still, sense. They're still a business. Yeah. Well, they all own stock in each other, so there's something to be said for it. But uh, now I, You were mentioning Atari a minute ago, and, and um, I recently watched a really, really good documentary on the death of, of mm. Atari. It's called Atari Game Over. Mm. Uh, it's on Netflix, so I highly recommend um, anyone who's interested in that. Um, let's call it the, uh, the urban legend behind E.T. being buried in the landfill and yeah. all of that. It turns out it's at least partially true, but not for the the reasons that people said. Mm. Um, and it was a really good film, really enjoyable. Because I, I think everybody remembers a couple of years ago, whenever it made the news that they they dug and oh my yes. goodness, they yes. found it. <laughs> well, there's more to the story than that, and it's it's documented very very well in that film. Mm. Atari game over. Mm. Um, so before we wrap this segment, though, I think we need to do some reckless speculation. Oh yes. So uh, any predictions for the NX? What do you guys think is that's going to be? Oh boy. <laughs> and I'll, I'll say this it's something I mentioned before we started recording but um, I will say I think that Legend of Zelda is going to be joint released on the NX and the Wii U um, similar to what they did with Twilight Princess and the Wii mm-hmm. I really do think that's going to happen I, I don't think they're going to move it exclusively to the NX but I think that they don't want because I don't think NX is going to be back compatible either mm. actually that's more reckless speculation I don't think it will be I think it'll be different enough and because of that I think they're going to they're going to work over time to have a port version available for the NX so that mm-hmm. people can buy the NX without yeah. having in order to yeah. play the game without feeling like they're going to they're miss it on Zelda and have to buy the Wii U as well mm-hmm. because they know that some people might do that but people will be pissed and it might impact the Nintendo NX sales mm-hmm. they want everyone buying the NX because they don't want to have a repeat of Wii U mm-hmm. some wild speculation on my part I think they're actually going to move back to if not the Wii remotes then something very very similar to it because that that those control schemes were very uh, successful for them, and they worked really well in terms of gameplay and stuff like that. Mm. So, I think we're going to see a return to not traditional, you know, handheld controllers like on the PS3 and Xbox and everything, but something kind of like the Wii that has motion controls, but still is a little bit more quote traditional than the. the I'm the actually going to be surprised to see um, VR support. Mm. Um, if they've got their own VR thing going on, because they already have that to an extent with the Wii U gamepad, the fact that you can sort of like look around with the pad, I wouldn't be surprised if they go back to kind of almost not Virtual Boy. Oh, oh God! Say, I was going to say, say they're, uh, they're re-releasing exactly. the Virtual Boy, yeah. right? So, okay. <laughs> yes, the, that, that's the, what the NX is. It's it, the Virtual Boy they, 2015. Yeah, it's just with you know better 3D and stuff like that. They, they it's just, basically just the Oculus, but they yeah. take the Nintendo thing on top of it. So, I was yeah. going to say the Oculus just, Boy. They just yeah. re release the Virtual Boy and they just draw like a line through Virtual Boy and write NX. Yeah, but no. In all seriousness, like you know, I. I'm hoping that the NX is, you know, at least if not more powerful than the current generation of consoles. It probably needs to be more so that it can kind of be ahead a little bit because they're staggering their release now at this point. Yeah. Um, as far as the console sort of generational shift. Um, you think the PS4, I mean the PS5 and the Xbox 2 or whatever are going to be coming out that quickly? I don't know. No, I don't think so. I think no. they're not going to come out no. for the five years. But that's why I'm honestly. saying that if they were even slightly ahead graphically, that would be a big advantage for them. Yeah, for that's not years. Nintendo's model. I, I know it's they not, be. but at the same time, the the hardware might be affordable enough at this point that they can make it work. Well, but so. we've hit we've hit HD, mm-hmm. so 4K. No, I don't know. no. I think by the way, I think it's absurd that some people have mentioned game 4K. I don't think we yeah. need it. Um, but anyway, I, I will say um, they have repeatedly said it's going to be different. So they're going to do something different with it. So mm-hmm. maybe they'll. I'm sure they'll include some sort of a motion thing. But in terms of going back to the Wii, the Wii controllers, I just I don't see that. I think it's going to be different in some way. Just because they said it would be. I so, think it's the last system that's going to have disc medium, media, media. 
That's, really? that's my wild speculation. You think we're moving to all digital? Uh, well, I think that... I think um, it's sad. Go I think that Sony and Microsoft and, and let's just call it the Google console or the Steam console mm-hmm. or the whatever it is, mm-hmm. that it's all going to go digital. Um, and I think we're going to see the terrible demise of certain stores that we've talked about in the past. Um, that's the one good thing. Yeah. But I think that... Game, GameStop? I think Nintendo's going to miss... GameStop. They're, they're going to they're gonna miss the bandwagon. They're not going to be the, the, the ones who break that ground on the cutting edge and I think they're going to be the last one with disc ironically I think that might also save them if they need saving that's my wild speculation for people like me that actually still the, want yeah. disc yeah us, you know us Gen Xers we're, we're all about uh, I've got it on my shelf and, and having it in your library is not the same thing as having it on your shelf um, but you know you skip a generation and, and it's like uh, oh yeah I have this massive library of, of tunes um, on iTunes Okay, I don't know a single iTunes song, not one. Sorry, I know this is the music episode. <laughs> I don't either, and I'll be honest. Yeah. I listen to a lot of stuff on SoundCloud because you're a Gen Xer. I listen to a lot of stuff on SoundCloud, and I think that's what I it don't. comes down to. I think that's yeah. one of the massive defining it. characteristics of the, the two generations. I think it has to do with whether or not you've got um, disc media or hard media on your shelf or not. Honestly, I just don't have the room for CDs. <laughs> I would like to get a you know a record player and have a vinyl collection or something like that. I've thought about that too. It's just the the, the expense is so high, yeah. but it would be so awesome. I've yeah. really thought about that yeah. many times. Well, and it was easy for me to get the the shelf space because all I had to do was sell my VHS, <laughs> and well, suddenly yeah. you know suddenly I had room for triple the collection. <laughs> I'm serious, and then that's what happened you know ten years ago. So I, I think that till the day I die, I'm probably going to have you know hard copies of stuff. Even if I have to burn them myself. I'm still buying DVDs. I only recently got the PS4, so I can now start buying Blu-ray, but I'm still going to get movies like that. I like to collect right. I like to collect some movies. I mean, and not stuff also, that's easy to find. But it's also so undependable. I mean, you go back to watch a movie on well, Netflix or something, and it's gone. Yeah. And Unfortunately. You know, it's like, whoa. And I really wonder what's going to happen on, on things like Prime, Amazon Prime, you know, mm-hmm. um, with their streaming, because you pay for that movie, and then what if they lose the rights to it? Do you lose the? Do you lose it? As well, how does, it, how does that work? I don't even know. I think the the I prime instant it. video and you purchasing the video digital download are two different rights sort of things. You you do that in uh, the Xbox as well as um, PlayStation as well. They have like little services where you can go in and you can purchase movies. And mm-hmm. I think PlayStation. I haven't explored the PlayStation one. I know it had it on my Xbox 360. Mm-hmm. So it's something that is all over the place, and yeah. that is a good question. Even if. You know, at some point, it's going to be... The, it's still stored on a server somewhere. And so, even though you have the option to download it, a lot of people don't. Because mm-hmm. they don't really see the reason to. And yeah. even if you do, you're eventually going to delete it because your hard drive isn't big enough. And yeah, you're not going to keep right. it on there forever. So now what happens when that server goes down? Mm-hmm. Which it will eventually. Now you don't have that movie anymore. And, and what yeah. about the data rot that comes to, uh, along with the different systems? For right. example, as um, soon as I get rid of my PS3, which is not going to happen anytime really soon... Um, I'm going to have a, a huge library of downloadable games that I can't play anymore. Right. Because when it comes to the smalls, I love to I love to do that. You know, I don't mm-hmm. buy I don't buy sixty dollars games as downloadables ever. Mm-hmm. I, I go by the disc. But uh, when it comes to you know the the little ten dollars games, yeah. Diff- oh yeah, you know, the ones you can only do is yeah. yeah. The, I do the, the PlayStation thing. Network download. So I've got quite a library of those, but I can't play those on my PS4. And and when when they do make them available on the PS4, I'm going to have to rebuy them? Is that, is that, is that what's going to happen? Well, another thing is that if you're going through games on an old console that you have, um, you, you, I mean, if you were to do it on a digital library and you find a game that you want to play, but then you have to download it for like, you know, an hour and a half, depending on your, uh, your download speed, you know, you might not be so inclined to do that. Whereas if you have a disc, it's like, oh, I'll just plop in, you know, Mario Sunshine on my GameCube. Really. Exactly. You know? So yeah. I've, I've had games where I thought I want to play this game and I start to download it and um, the next day it comes around and yeah. I don't want to play it anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to play it that night right then, but I couldn't. Well, I, I love uh, this idea of, of rights and, and uh, another stick a pen and in that it. kind of thing. Let's stick a pen let's in stick it. Let's stick a pen in it and move on. So yeah, we'll go in and uh, transition now to the uh, main topic of discussion for tonight, which as we mentioned is going to be music and video games. And again, kind of a generalist view of it, we're not necessarily focusing specifically on how music does this, or music in this game, or whatever. Yeah. Um, we've brought Nick on because he's actually done uh, quite a bit of learning in the area of um, 
how stuff like chiptune works, like how the original sound chips or, or cards or whatever they were, yeah. and like you know the NES and stuff like that, how they worked. And mostly NES. I don't know yeah. much about anything else. Honestly, um, but you know, like that's you know, great. It's perfect for me. <laughs> like like we alluded to, um, you know, games music is very important to setting tone and stuff like that in games and. Um, you know, bad music can hurt the game experience quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Good music can help it a ton. Um, you know, using um, silence in the right places, that sort of thing, can mm-hmm. make a big impact on, you know, kind of the tone and the feeling of the oh, game. Oh, that was so, so big. Especially back, I mean, even back in, you know, the NES days with that, with the music, um, because the visuals were so, you know, low, low key, you needed the music to kind of help set the tone mm-hmm. and help you get in the right mindscape, mind space. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and I do remember in uh, uh, Metroid was actually really good at using music to influence the different stages that you were in and get yourself in the right mood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, it's, there was that you know the moment where um, you go into I believe it's I believe it's the room where you're shooting the statues where to get to Mother Brain. I think that's where it goes silent except for your jumping. Is that is that right, Nick? I think so. I haven't played the original. Uh Metroid. I think they time. did a similar thing though in Zero Mission, which was the yeah. Well, that was the remake. Yeah, the remake. But yeah, like yeah. they they um. Let's stick a pin in that one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I thought we already defined remakes and remixes and all that. Sort no, of stuff, no, so. just how much <laughs> I was disappointed in that game. But that's 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 uh, another, that's another tale. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, like I, I just I loved how they did that, where you go into this this room and suddenly there's no music, and it's yeah. extremely unnerving. And there's no monsters. Especially since there's been music throughout the entire yes. game up until that point. It's kind of uncanny. And there's no enemies. There's yep. no enemies. And all you see are these little lifeless statues. And you're just like, whoa. And a lot of times you find this. Um, I knew I did the first time through. Um, you would find this before you would ever find either of the two enemy hideouts. Because this is supposed to be your moment where you realize, oh, in order to get, in order to, you know, find my way through this move and get past all the little lava to get to the door on the other side, mm-hmm. I have to do something with these statues. And the yep. statues were like representations of the two hidden bosses that were in the game. Mm-hmm. Cried and Ridley. Yep. There's kind of an interesting thing for me too. Um, doors and keys, of... Doc. I know. <laughs> doors before keys. There's yep. a sequence. Um, yep. Doors before keys. Yep. In, in kind of a similar vein, um, I remember when I was playing Metal Gear Solid, um, there would be times when, like, you know, most of the music in there tends to be a little bit more subdued, um, or if there is, like, anything more upbeat, it's kind of, like, action movie-ish. It's when you get um, caught or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's interesting about that is that you might have, like, a really long conversation, especially if one that's meant to kind of, like, depress more than excite, mm-hmm. you know? Not that they're trying to depress you, necessarily, but it does kind of set a more a serious, somber tone. Um and then you re or you uh, just have this conversation, this long conversation with no background music, just lots and lots of dialogue. And then you start going again, and it's nothing but sound effects. Um, and I remember that was a really interesting sort of moment for me, as far as um, uh, just like kind of have like this weird um, sense of, I guess, loneliness in a way, something like that, um, where. Uh, and, and by then too, a lot of times the um, the sneaking through the base almost has become routine, and so it's almost like this kind of machine sort of feeling where it's just very emotionless. And oh look, there's a guy. I'm going to sneak past him or beat him up or shoot him or whatever mm-hmm. it is. But you're kind of just mm-hmm. going through the motions at that point. It was a really neat sort of um, uh, aesthetic experience. Yeah, I didn't mm-hmm. like Metal Gear Solid either. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have enough pins. To say this episode. Running out of pins, man. We need more pins so I can tell you how you're wrong. We'll save the pins for later. The guy over there is bleeding out. We need to give him a break. So. We need to actually get. Oh, that would be so. Well, we'll keep that. <laughs> an actual little like pin cushion and yeah. bring in pens, and then every time we stick a pen in it, we'll stick it in, and that way you can look at it as we're reviewing it, and then be like, okay, we have like four pins. We have to go through the episode and find. Maybe we should get one of down. our uh, one of our hobbyist friends to make little plushies in our likenesses. Yeah. There we go. Oh, voodoo. Like, yeah, voodoo. Um, <laughs> I didn't say voodoo. <laughs> yeah, you know, that would be hilarious. Though. We'll practice the voodoo. Man. I'll work on his uh, <laughs> pin stick sound effect for you guys. <laughs> Um, would it have been oh, better if, I, great, yeah. if I'd said uh, Deus Ex Human Evolution or Revolution or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a bad. Okay, uh, uh, then that we'll just edit that in. Okay, uh, that's what I said. Uh, okay, um, but getting back to um, early days, Nintendo uh, NES specifically, which I know is where you know Nick kind of yeah. knows a lot about. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the sound card or? Is yeah, it, is it, is it, it's not really a sound card. It's it? a sound chip. There's sound actually chip? there's a specific uh, sound chip, and that's why they call it chip tune. Mm. Um, I love I love Chip Tune, but I don't know all the, the details. Yeah, how many different noises could it make? Uh, well, there were five channels on the uh, NES sound chip, um, two of which were 
the same. They're called pulse channels. And then there is a triangle channel and a noise channel. And then there was also a um, a sample channel. Backward compatible. So basically, in in simple terms, the pulse channels were, or the pulse channels and the triangle channels were, you know, they would play notes, and those are the actual sounds that you would hear. And then the noise channel was uh, sort of a more percussive, just white noise, like shh, that sort of thing. And that would be used mostly used for percussion um, in in nest music. Um, and then the sample channel, you could bring in like drum sound effects and stuff like that, just if you want to have some extra stuff. But it would actually require a lot of storage space, so most of the time those weren't used. That, that's also where you'd put in um, voiceover if you had any, yeah, um, which was pretty rare back in those days. But um, yeah. the sample channel, you could actually just record a voice and have that pop up. Backward compatible. Arwen the cat heavily, is, uh, heavily sampled voice stalking the oh, table yes. right now. Yes. The very bit crush. Oh, 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 oh. What did he say? <laughs> <laughs> but it was a, that was a cool effect back in the day too. Eh, in retrospect, maybe. In, in, <laughs> depending on well, but it also. It, I guess if you were in the, in if, the times, yeah, if you, and you heard that, it's like, oh, this game actually talked. You know, that was a big. I don't know. It was a big push when um, the Genesis came out because they had the little Sega. Sega. Yeah. Or Sega. Mm-hmm. Later, the Sega. commercials. Sega. Yeah, Super Nintendo made a big deal about that, yeah, that too. Yeah, but it's, the Genesis came out before. Super it did, it did. Um, but I, I was just thinking of, like, Star Fox, you know, which oh, was yeah. a Super Nintendo game. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. it actually had the voices. They didn't, weren't actually saying it, but... Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. But the thing I like about um, chiptune and that sort of music is that because it was so limited, you could only have three, you know, melodic voices playing at any given time, uh, the composers had to really rely on uh their their composition skills you know they had to it had to be really good music from an objective standpoint because the timbre or the timbre of the um sort of uh the the actual notes don't sound that great on their own necessarily i guess in retrospect they kind of sound you know cool and retro but back then it was just like electronic yeah no i mean i think that they some of them were you know, like wizards, the sort of things that they can do. Oh, yeah. You know, very incredible. I know um, Konami and Capcom, um, you know, the two big non-Nintendo developers on for the NES, yep. did some great things mm-hmm. with uh, with sound chips. What's interesting is that um, in Japan, on the uh, Famicom, uh, there was actually, there were some chips that, that the sound chips that uh, the developers, especially Konami, would put into the actual game cartridge that you couldn't do in the United States because of some weird law regarding, mm. uh, you know, modifying the cartridges. And and that was for that was for the Famicom, right? Not the yeah. FDS. For the Famicom, okay. yeah. And you could actually put it would make it so there was actually a few more sound channels that they could add. So I think they actually added an extra pulse channel and an extra like a new cool. saw wave sort of thing. So if if you'll you can actually find this on YouTube if you Google you know the difference between the Japanese version and the American version of the music in certain in yeah like US Castlevania or something. yeah Castlevania three I think um, actually had a different sound hmm. of music so it, it's interesting how how uh, how different it is so yeah I know the um, the um, FDS the Famicom Disk System which uh, was like you know they're sort of like expansion to the Famicom. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, in the U.S., they basically just gave us the carts that would run on the NES, but they didn't have the extra sound channel. It might, it might, I don't know if it was one extra sound channel or, or more than one. You might know. But, um, for example, Metroid was originally, and so was Legend of Zelda. They were both um, FDS games. They were both mm-hmm. uh, disk system games. They weren't really originally Famicom games, and they became NES games in the U.S. because that's what yep. we had, but it took away some of that sound. Mm-hmm. I don't know much about the disk system, to the be disc honest. So, yeah. yeah, if you look up um, Metroid, for example, yeah. and you listen to the soundtrack, it's you know clearly the same the same music, mm-hmm. but it's slightly different instruments, and there's like a, an extra channel or two. Yeah. So it's a little bit different. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because Metroid was like, the soundtrack in Metroid is pretty minimalistic, mm-hmm. and it relies mostly on atmosphere, because... But it fits the game. The game yeah. itself is lonely. So, like, yeah. that minimalistic, you know, like, that style of music really does build... Yeah, so I don't I don't think it even needed the extra channels, to be honest. It sounded, yeah. it sounded fine as it well, was. The way they use it more, if I remember right, I have to go back and listen to the soundtrack again. Um, it's the same style. It's still very much trying to keep... Mm-hmm. Trying not to overdo it. Trying yeah. to be... 
subdued, but it's just they're a little bit different. Like there's there's a little better quality to each of the different channels. Mm. Okay. So they're able they're able to you know, and it's it's different too. Like when you listen to it, because for me, I had an, a reaction where at first I'm like, I don't like this. Because it wasn't what I was used to. Yeah. But it was. But it. But you know, I listened to it some more, and I'm like, well, you know, it's actually pretty good. You just, if you're not used to it. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this, because um, I, I mean, I have some favorites. I, I, I really like you know old NES sounds, and I, I think so, some of the games that came out that maybe were a little bit underrated also have some great soundtracks, like mm-hmm. uh, Batman, the first Batman game on uh, the NES, mm-hmm. which I believe was by Konami. Oh no, I'm sorry, it was by Sunsoft. Um, that's that's the developer to talk about too. Sunsoft, they yeah. do some great stuff with music. Oh yeah, definitely. Do you know? Do you have any other examples of that? Did you play Batman or have you I heard not. the music for it? I, well, I know that Sunsoft did a lot of uh, they they innovated a lot in, yeah. in NES uh, music composition. Um, they actually put a lot of great use with uh, the samples sample channel that I was talking about mm. because I'm not, I don't want to get too into like the super technical stuff with the sampling channel, but there were. It was very constricting if you wanted to do anything other than, let's say, percussion. But they found a way to work with um, melodic samples and and uh, use those in a way that... So you could have four melodic voices instead of just the standard three. And they hmm. they did some really interesting stuff with, like, bass lines using the sample channel. That, okay, thank you. I knew, I knew I was trying to remember, and I want and I didn't want to say, say wrong until you yeah. confirmed it for me, <laughs> that... It was Sunsoft that did like the really cool like bass yeah. sounds, and Batman had those. Yeah, they had um, really cool synthesizers that yeah. weren't just the standard pulse waves. If you like Ninja Gaiden, if you're one of those people that likes Ninja Gaiden and you haven't really played a whole lot of the NES library, play Batman. It's basically Ninja Gaiden, oh. but you're Batman. It's basically Batman very Gaiden. similar. <laughs> very similar in terms of the action, the platforming, um, an excellent soundtrack. Can, can you win at Batman? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, it's, it's, not, a, it's, it's, it's not like Ninja Gaiden. You can win at Ninja Gaiden, too. They're both just, they're <laughs> both just incredibly hard, and they're all about like memorizing. Because a lot of times you can't, you're not exactly sure where you're jumping or like where an enemy's going to come out at you as you jump, just like Ninja Gaiden. Like, so you have just, to memorize the level, and it's, yeah. it's not good. Games, oh, yeah, it's, 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 it's it can get kind of annoying. Yeah. But at the same time, even though you, you have that element to it, it's like everything, it's very much arcade style where you're, if you know what you're doing, you can blow through it, but if you don't, you kind of have to die many, many that's, times. That's kind of the impression I got actually from yeah. the uh, original um, arcade Strider because I actually looked at that when yeah. we played Strider. Oh yeah. There. oh yeah, And that was definitely one of those things where it looked like if you knew what you were doing, like the per- the playthrough I saw, was just like that was flying through the game. It took them all of, like fifteen minutes to finish the entire thing. Um, but I imagine it would have been a lot harder if you were actually just playing it for the first time in the arcade. But yeah. without getting off topic, so so because there's there's some great soundtracks on. Or specific songs too, if we want to go there. Do you have a specific? I mean, there's there's some that I think that are that are that are awesome. I know I, I mentioned Sunsoft. I don't know if Sunsoft did. Was it? It may it may have been Sunsoft. It could have maybe it was LGN. Do you know who did Silver Surfer? I do not. You've heard that soundtrack. I I, I would hope. I think so. Probably. Okay. It, it, in my opinion, it's actually the best soundtrack on the NES. The game is terrible, <laughs> uh, but the soundtrack is awesome. Hmm. And uh, the composer for it was Tim Follin, and he did a lot of um, Genesis games. Actually, was, oh, he's yeah. kind of well known for doing Genesis tracks. Yeah. But he did the NES game, and if you listen to it, um, what he does with the the sound chips, the sound chip for the NES, the sound chip. Am I using the right term? Uh, you can call it whatever you okay. want. I, I say sound chip. Okay, <laughs> but but what I, he I manages to do with it, it doesn't even sound like. It sounds like you know, really professional electronic music. It just like doesn't even sound like he's using the chip. It's oh, like yeah. he just broke all the rules somehow. It's really really incredibly awesome. Like the first song, um, when you're in in the stage, I can't remember. It's got some crazy name for it, but I mean, you, the whole concept of the game. It's much cooler than actually what what the game itself. But of course, as Silver Surfer, you're basically on a surfboard surfing through outer space. Mm-hmm. So you know he manages to make this song where it's like, yeah, it's you're this badass surfing through outer space. It sounds really cool. Unfortunately, the game the game is terrible, so it breaks that. <laughs> but yeah. um, that's why I, I think a lot of people haven't heard the soundtrack, or if they have, they've only heard very small snippets of it because huh. you die very fast. Um, I, I found this guy on YouTube, and what he does is essentially he takes old um, NES. I mean, you, you may know who I'm talking about. He takes old NES uh, soundtracks and he basically makes them stereo. Yeah, that's all he does. Oh, yeah. I've he's, heard that. He's, he's, stuff like that. You know I don't know if it's the same guy. I've seen. Some well, I think he's the only guy that that does it. I mean, I've seen videos like that on YouTube, so that's yeah. What it is. He basically <laughs> does these, and and he doesn't change. He doesn't like try to redo it with different instruments yeah. or anything like that. It's the exact same. He just wipes sound the, chips. The yeah. Channels. yeah. Um, but he does a great job on it. Like listening to this stuff, especially with um, with headphones, it kind of is like a whole new experience. Yeah. 
I think really part of the, the charm of NES music is that it's all mono, though. It's got no special effects or anything. It's just, it's amazing what they can do with such a constricted space. Because in music composition, uh, especially nowadays with electronic music uh, and modern production in general, mm-hmm. the, the stereo space is a really important thing to consider when you're com- composing music because you don't want to have too many, say, low frequencies in the middle. Um, you want to spread them out more. Or, you know, th- this is getting kind of technical, but, like, it, you wouldn't want to have, you know, two opposing melodies panned all the way to the right because you're all, they're going to sound kind of jumbled up. If you'd want to have one of them to the right and one of them to the left so you can hear them separately. Um, but on the NES, they didn't have that. They had to keep everything in the middle, and they had to write the music in a certain way so that the melodies wouldn't, you know, uh, oppose each other and conflict and make it sound bad, you know. So... It's an interesting uh, sound that emerged out of the limitations that they had. Hmm. There was an interesting thing I remember um, we talked about in um, game design classes, and um, you know we didn't talk about music too much. It was kind of more like an afterthought because when we were talking game design, it tended to be um, about like how you design systems and how things sort of interlay with each other and with yeah. the player experiences, that sort of deal. But you would usually have a section in your design document that you write up about music. Um, and it was kind of funny because uh, one of my professors uh, said that the way you test to see if your music is good is if you can basically play it on loop for you know at least 20 minutes without getting tired of it. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't get tired of it, you know it's great music for yeah. a game. But if you do get tired of it, you need to scrap it and start over because if, if the players start to get tired of it, it's going to start really hurting the experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it really is interesting how... Again, you know, like a lot of sort of things in sound design, if you're doing your job right, you don't notice it. Mm -hmm. As soon as they notice, you're usually not doing something right. Now, sometimes they can notice it because it's just so awesome. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But that should be more an exception than the rule. And I also think that the whole, like, don't notice it rule is not necessarily true because even if you're not on a conscious level Mm -hmm. saying, yeah, this music is awesome, Mm -hmm. as you're playing the game, it's influencing your mood, it's influencing Mm -hmm. your experience. So you're still, part of the the experience of, wow, I'm loving this game and it's it's great and I feel, you feel really tense or you feel, Mm -hmm. you know, sad or excited or whatever the music is trying to make you feel, Mm -hmm. uplifted, whatever, Mm -hmm. is because of the music, even if you're not consciously realizing it's because of the music. Mm -hmm. Not Exclusively, obviously, it's all, yeah. it all goes together. It's, it's a holistic experience. Actually, yeah. I mean, if you've got music that's too good for your game, that's going to stand out, you know? Right, like Silver Surfer. <laughs> yeah. It stands out because the game is, is trash. <laughs> so you, the soundtrack is the only reason you ever really want to put that game in your system. Mm. I remember, um, actually, I think the most recent soundtrack that I really, really loved um, was Fire Emblem Awakening. Um, that's a great one that had some really great music in there and because it's a turn based game it's not so action driven so you're kind of you might say allowed to have a little bit more of like a uh, the type of music you listen to as opposed to just sort of hear as you play Um, and I remember there were some scenes in particular where just like the mood just hits you because it's either triumphant or super sad or um, you know kind of mixed emotions sort of thing um, and I just really love the soundtrack in that game and I'm sure everyone has kind of the game that they can point to that says um, this game hit me on so many emotional levels in addition to just like oh I love this game because it had really cool music you mm-hmm. know? yeah Metroid is one of those for me yeah. Metal, Metal Gear Solid Metroid. 4 mm-hmm. Metal Gear Solid oh, 4 MGS4 was that was a really good soundtrack yeah, yeah. really great soundtrack mm-hmm. to be fair that game is pretty cinematic so yeah, yeah. and they had a cinematic composer working on it yeah mm-hmm. but the way that they worked it in mm-hmm. it was just brilliant like mm-hmm. it was as good if not better than most films mm-hmm. so. I was kind of dis- I was disappointed in a lot of ways with MGS4 but not the soundtrack the soundtrack mm-hmm. is so great and I sometimes will just listen to the soundtrack when I'm doing work I can it see is, why brilliant. you would have been disappointed with MGS4 because yeah. of how you know the, the the main complaint with that game is that the cutscenes are ridiculously yeah. long and that's something that I complain about a lot yeah, yeah. but I, to be honest MGS4 is the game that made the movie sort of game uh, acceptable to me <laughs> because I'm like that game is so well directed and so well written that it works the, the sort of movie interactive movie sort of thing actually worked with that game whereas mm-hmm. if it was a, a, a worse game that had that sort of thing I'd be complaining about it the whole time so so, kind of to segue into a bit of a different topic in this area, though, um, the idea of games being interactive and having um, reactive soundtracks. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, yeah. A good example I really like, actually, is um, 
the Wind Waker, Legend of Zelda, where you would, you know, hit an enemy and you'd have, like, a little chime that would come up. And then, like, if you hit them in sequence, it would actually, in play sync to the music, it would play, like, a little melody. Well, yeah. Yeah. speaking of that, one of the earliest games to do that was um, Cupert, mm. which, uh, in the arcade, where yeah. the, every time you'd take a step, it would make, it's like the musical feat. It's true, yeah. Yeah, and that's one of the earliest versions of that. But, of course, it's been, obviously, used in different ways. It's just scaling up and scaling down, right. so that was pretty easy to do. Yeah, make yeah. It sound like music. But I think but, both but Zelda still and, not, and, um, yeah. and Shadow of the Colossus do the thing where like big moments in gameplay. That's what I yeah, always think of. Yeah. yeah, that's my go-to. Um, like you do a thing, and then the music changes as a result of that, mm -hmm. and it kind of progresses along with the player. It's been a big. It's been like something that's been going on for a while now, and I mm -hmm. think. I mean, it's it's been used. Sometimes it's worked. Sometimes it doesn't. It kind of just depends on the game and the experience. Mm -hmm. I think you sort of lose a little something if you're trying to get lost in a world where mm -hmm. the music is just too reactive. Oh yeah, to yeah. me, you can't yeah. you can't overdo it. Yeah, but I think the only time the music has been reactive in Wind Waker is when you said when you mm -hmm. hit the yeah. enemies and it mm -hmm. does that sound. Yeah, so. or like you know you you sort of make a breakthrough on a boss fight and then the music gets like more amped up because it's like oh this is your yeah. time to strike. You oh know? well, of course there's also the you know yeah. when you're opening a chest. Yeah, you know. But that's that's all stuff that's. Uh, it's not like you do an action and it plays a melody. Oh, sure, it's yeah. not like every time you walk through a door, it's like does a jingle or something like that. Then mm. that'd get really distracting and annoying. <laughs> so it turned into like a sitcom where like someone walks through the door. It's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I get Babs. So yeah, I think we we sort of missed some people. I was trying to go around and see what game what game music people really sort of connected with. Um, Doc, do you have some answers for that? Um, well, actually, Shadow of the Colossus really is one of mine. Um, I used to use that as an example whenever I did the the sound lecture mm -hmm. on uh, in my game design class years ago. But I'll throw out there uh, probably the the one single game soundtrack that had the strongest emotional reaction in me, and that was um, Assassin's Creed Two. Mm. Yeah, um, that really one was um, just explosive to me. I I, I I'm just not the kind of guy who downloads music, but I downloaded that one. Um, not on iTunes. Uh, but, you know, I actually put it on a loop and, and listened to it and played it because um, that one was just so good. And part of it for me was that I had been to those places. That was the one that was set in Italy and Florence. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I stood on top of the Duomo, uh, gosh, it's been 15, 20 years ago now, um, you know, I had a strong emotional reaction in that game. It took me back there. You know, just like physically yeah. reinserted me back into uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Colosseum and to the other thing. The Colosseum was the next game, but you get my point. It yeah. is, um, That's back when Assassin's Creed was a good... Yeah, actually, yeah. that's a good point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think AC2 is the strongest entry of all. Oh, definitely. Um, that's one of my amazing. favorite games of Brotherhood time. was pretty good, though. It, it yeah. was pretty good. Um, but... As far as um, the music with them, I think that that was the one that, that was the strongest entry, and, and I still, um, like, when, at the beginning, spoiler, uh, when when the brother dies, mm. I mean, that one just wrenched me. I was just like, oh, no! <laughs> yeah. and of course, you know, that was, was the motivation and all that stuff, but now you've got some of these newer games, and it's like, oh, okay, I'm a pirate again, or I'm a whatever, and uh, oh, what's my motivation? I, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm an assassin, right? That's right. I mean, but you'll buy people. it because it's Assassin's Creed. Well, I, That's I, what they do. That's honestly, they do. I have stopped... I have stopped. I'm off. I'm off the AC uh, <laughs> drug now. Mm -hmm. My dad still loves them, um, and so I just borrow them from him. I was done. off after AC too. Were you? I was never really that into it anyway. Really? I do see what you mean. Though. The soundtrack was excellent. I yeah. agree. Oh yeah. Um, a recent one that I really like soundtrack wise, uh, Witcher Three actually has a great soundtrack. Does it's it? Pretty cool that they um, they give you the soundtrack CD with the uh, uh, with the game. Yeah, that's pretty cool. When you buy it, it's that just part cool. of the game. It's not even a special edition. So whenever you buy the digital download, they give you the free. Uh... That's that's yeah. Back what? to physical media. Oh no, they they didn't do that. They give you a whole bunch of little stuff, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, so Project Red is great. Oh, speaking of um, things where you can get the soundtrack included, yeah. um, there's an addition going back to last week with Transistor, which also has an excellent, excellent soundtrack. Yes, yeah, that we talked about. Um, yeah, we don't want to return to that too much. Yeah, <laughs> but um, you know, it's just really good soundtrack. So if you're curious about our thoughts on that one, you can go back to last week's episode number 33 and hear about that. Yeah, that would also be the episode where we forbade you from ever saying the word uh, Batman again. And what did you do? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said Batman again. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, um, but yeah, I, I know in that, what you were talking about before about, you know, music taking you back to, to a different place. I think that's one of the things to bring us back kind of full circle to the nest. One of the things that I really like about listening to um, music on the nest is not just because I do think a lot of it is good music and I do think it improved my experience, but it also takes me back to my experiences when I was young and playing through those games. And I didn't travel a lot aside from, you know, moving around the U.S. and stuff, but in terms of actually going outside and <laughs> that kind of thing. I didn't do a lot of that when I was, when I was young. So I, I traveled, you know, spiritually to, you know, planet, uh, what was it? Um, Zebus? M- oh, yeah, thank you, Zebus. Or, like, I traveled to Hyrule or something through yeah. music. I yeah. traveled to the Mushroom Kingdom. So, you know, some of these experiences I had... There are other uh, ways musically. to get to the mushroom. Kingdom, <laughs> yeah, there are. <laughs> we, don't, we don't encourage those ways, but they but we acknowledge they exist. Yes. Um, yes, but um, th- listening to the music too, it also kind of transports me back to that time as well. So it, it has that connection, the nostalgic connection that I think you were talking about with us. Yeah, Creed, I agree. So. Yeah. So is it hard to make music for something that is by definition interactive? No, it's incredibly easy. No. <laughs> I, I see that uh, just to just to throw some comparative light on yeah, it. You know, yeah, these hacks yeah, like oh, I don't know, John Williams. You know, uh, they they have these movies given to them, and then yeah. they're like, here, just put some music on this, you know, stagnant thing that that's going to be the same every time you watch right. it. Um, and then you've got the geniuses out there who have to do it for for an interactive medium. Um, and you have to balance the sound effects with it too. It's got to yeah, somehow right. fit, especially when you have a game that's like a shooter, like Life Force that I talked about earlier. Where the sound effects for for your, you shooting the different sound effects for different bullets, bullets, or yeah. lasers, yeah. Um, those have to kind of like you still have to first you have to dedicate a channel to that, yeah. and then you have to also have it not feel so out of place That's with the rest of the music. There are times yeah. on the NES where you'll you'll hear like the one of the when melodies the sa- pop out yeah. while the sound effects plays, yeah. mm-hmm. and you know it still sounds good, or yeah. you don't even notice mm-hmm. it, anymore, right? So. That's true, yeah. Um, and and by the way, that was high sarcasm there. Uh, when, yeah, John Williams, if you're listening to this, we love you. Yeah, we, we really do. <laughs> you are amazing. Um, you will probably be the only good thing about the new Star Wars movies too. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, let's yeah. stick a pen in that. Okay. <laughs> well, they're not out yet, but they was definitely the only good thing about the prequels. Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. Stick okay. another pen in that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no comment. We, we we still have yet to do the uh, Star Wars transmedia episode. We need yeah, to. I'm it sure is, it is coming. I, w- I want to spend like 40 minutes bitching about the prequels. <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting here wearing my Star Wars T-shirt. <laughs> Haven't right we now? already done that like five times on probably, the podcast? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Anyway. More, yeah. more bitching is always fun. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's very true. Anyway. We should have a separate podcast for just bitching about the prequels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I know, I know we talked. About- the episode just called "Those Prequels," though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so um, I did kind of want to, you know, let you kind of close off, uh, Nick, because I know we're getting farther on time. But mm. um, just any sort of thoughts that you have, or you want to, anything else you want to add about Nintendo or NES music, since that's kind of like your area of expertise. Or is there something that you want to say, like, hey, guys, you need to listen to this or play this game for this music? Or uh, well, anything? some of my favorite soundtracks, um, I didn't grow up with the NES. I just like, you know, the sound that it comes with yeah. for chiptune because I mostly grew up with, like, a Game Boy, and that it's a similar sound. Um, but some of my favorite soundtracks uh, have actually been more modern games, like uh, Skyrim is one of my favorite soundtracks. It's very good. All, yeah. all of uh, Elder Scrolls, mostly, but... Um, also, probably the best part of that game. Uh, More stick a pen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Skyrim annoyed me in a lot of different ways, but the soundtrack was excellent. No, yeah, the soundtrack uh, added a lot to the atmosphere and in, in, in that game. Yeah, you so. know, Pandora agrees with you. If you try to create a channel that's all about Lord of the Rings or something, and you wait an hour, um, basically you're going to have uh, Zelda. You're going to have um, Elder Scrolls. Elder Scrolls. Yeah, and you're going to have. And yeah, <laughs> and it's, like, it's it's all you know free game. All oh, those Lord of the Rings soundtracks oh, are so excellent. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. yeah. Mm. And Hobbit too. All the only excellent. good thing about the oh no, that's not true. No, that's not true. That's not true. That's true. Those are great movies too. Yeah. Oh, but anyway, the only good thing about the Hobbit movies were the soundtracks. Oh, see. Oh, oh, no way, man. Those were great. Stick, anyway, go stick, ahead. Stick all the pins in it. All the pins. Um No, I mean, I just I like that soundtrack. I like lots of game soundtracks. The thing, I mean, I think what keeps me, I think the one thing that stood out to me most when I was playing video games as a kid was the music. 
Yeah. Um, also, like, you know, playing and shooting things, but it was mm-hmm. mostly the music because, you know, I'll, I still have, you know, soundtracks from games that I played when I was, you know, seven. And it was, uh, you know, I have the entire, you know, Link's Awakening soundtrack on my phone. Mm-hmm. It's like a hundred tracks of just, like, chiptune. And it's it's great, you know, that's the sort of stuff I like to listen to. So, so if you could... Like, was there... Because you said you didn't grow up with the NES. No. This will be my last question, I promise. <laughs> Is there a game that... The game soundtrack, rather, from the NES that you listened to and that was kind of what got you into wanting to learn more about the NES sound chips? Uh, I don't know if there was one that really wanted me to get into it, but uh, my favorite NES soundtrack for sure is uh, Zelda 2. That's a great one. Mm. That's because a really great soundtrack. The the dungeon theme or the palace theme, you can listen to that for hours and yeah. not get tired of it. And which they, I did while I was playing and getting angry at the game. <laughs> and they remixed that a lot too for later later editions, like in yeah. uh, Smash Brothers and Smash Chris, Brothers. Stop. Chris. <laughs> I'm setting background music. <laughs> you can do that in post. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's legal for me to do that in post. It is. Which is why I'm doing it here with my mouth. No, up to, it's up to legal. twelve seconds. Uh, okay, up to twelve seconds. Twelve seconds of uh, of Palestine, go. So, uh, so copyright law and uh, fair use. Stick a pin in that. Well, thank you everyone for joining us on uh, episode number 34 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. Thank you, Nick, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you and of course, uh, I th- I'm pretty sure we said it earlier, but thank you again very much for all the musics, yeah. um, oh, including yeah. the uh, the new one you're going to be writing this week for Reckless Speculation. So, yeah. um, as, as you're <laughs> hearing and this, the stick of pen in the, but, 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 you have yeah. a job, right? <laughs> but, but between, uh, between <laughs> us recording this right now and you hearing it, uh, oh, faithful listeners, Nick will have written a new tune that we will put on the podcast. So Seriously, buy this dude a pizza. I mean, he's <laughs> A wizard. Actually, yeah. I do that. I do that quite a lot. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so yeah, we haven't. So we should. There you go. Pizza party. Mm-hmm. Yes. Ooh, pizza party. Uh, as long as Although, it's gluten free. Yeah, I was about to say, Doc can't have gluten, so yeah. we can get you some wings or something. Although you can't really do fried. Right? I was gonna say. Yeah. No, wings aren't fried. How about the salad? Some that's are. always the oh, greatest. I guess it depends. Yeah. <laughs> I thought mostly grilled, aren't they? Um, like I said, some of them are. Mm. If it's like the boneless ones and they have all that like breading and they're yeah, and yeah. They're, no. But I'm talking about just they're meat. basically nuggets. Yeah, mm. not nuggets. Yeah, this is a topic for another day. All right, we'll stick, stick a pin. <laughs> the poor stick a pin in it, guys. Just getting uh, yeah. Just these past few weeks have been so tough on poor guy. All right, well, I guess uh, that's that's us. We're signing off. This is Jim. I'm Chris. Oh, and I'm Doc. Hi. Yeah, and I'm Nick. I mean, bye. <laughs> Man, thanks for joining us. See you next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us about your favorite video game soundtracks. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.